Game day, game day, game day, game day, game day, woo! I do not have a copy of Chrono Trigger, which would have fit the theme of this whole episode perfectly, but I do have other games that kind of fit. Let's take a look at one of them. Faxanadu, or as someone I hold dear would affectionately refer to it as Faxi, is a game for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Made by Hudson Soft and released in Japan in 1987, PAL Territories in 1990, and in the US in 1989, this game is more of a spin-off in the Dragon Slayer series. The name Faxanadu is also a portmanteau of Famicom Xanadu. Although, I am a bit worried about what's going on on the front of the box. We can clearly see what looks like an emblem in the shape of a shield, and on it, it has a city and a tree engraved. That's all well and good, but that tree is enormous! Heaven forbid if a big enough storm hit that would cause it to topple over, it would crush half of that city! Whoever did the planning, you peoples need to rescan your zoning layouts and gunk. Also, why is the rest of the box all crackly looking? Did something strike it and cause some damage? Is it that storm I was talking about earlier? Oh lord, we need to evacuate everybody! Alright, let's put this into the x I mean the retro do. I think it would work a little bit better that way. We start out with the title screen that the developers clearly put a decent amount of time into. Good design. And the music is some of the most uplifting title screen music I've ever heard. Off to a good start. Beginning the game gives us a brief cutscene of what looks like a young man walking towards the city at the large tree from the box art. Ooh, significant. When we actually get there though, internal dialogue pops up to tell us that this is his home, it appears to be mostly deserted, and it is already starting to crumble. Going inside shows that there are still some people remaining, but not many. Talking to one of the ladies here reveals that this is the elf town of Aeolus, located at the bottom of the World Tree. We are told to speak with the local guru and the king. The guru, being located at a rather spiritual-looking structure, gives us a ring for identification. That makes me wonder, what happened to cause our elf avatar character here to return to his home with no armor, no weapons, no items, no money, and no identification? At the opening dialogue, he claims to have been on a long journey, so surely he would have brought things with him, like proper gear and provisions, right? Where did they all go? He also has about a fifth of his total health gauge full! What event played out that ended with our elfie guy coming home broke, injured, and defenseless? Anyway, the guru tells us that there are other gurus out in the world, and that it would definitely be in our best interest to seek them out. Noted. Going into some of the buildings in the town show us shops such as a key shop, probably a locksmith of sorts, and a general store where the merchant sells armors, weapons, spells, and basically everything else in this game. Side note, you might think that the general store guy is going to completely drain out all the business from the key guy once the evil has been purged from the land. But in all honesty, you're going to spend an equal amount of time and maybe money buying what you need from both. Keys are more important than half the items in this world, so the key guy can definitely pull his share of the economic weight. As we talk to the inhabitants of the world throughout the game, we slowly piece together what's happening. The dwarves have invaded the elvish settlements and are ruthlessly destroying everything. This is because the dwarves were transformed into horrible monsters due to an evil being that crashed on the planet from outer space. Our role in all this is suiting up, finding the legendary Dragon Slayer sword, and defeating the evil one. We are the elves' last hope. A note of significance for a moment, this game regularly shows people smoking and drinking. This is in a Nintendo game. From the 90s. I have no idea how Hudson Soft pulled this one off while still getting the Nintendo seal of approval, but they did. Bonus points to you guys for the extra realistic grit. Evil rock from space turning the dwarves into raging monsters. The hideous abominations storming our civilizations and killing everyone they find. Elvish society as a whole crumbling beneath our feet. Might as well light them up. Pass me that bottle too, Bruno. Paying the royalty a visit gives us some more information. Mainly that the magical fountains have been drying up and what water is left is being poisoned. Add restoring the fountains to the to-do list because most living, breathing organisms cannot survive without water. The only way that you can restore them is with the magical properties of the mysterious elixir. You can only ever have one in your inventory, and it automatically refills your health and magic 
when your health drops to zero. Here's where it brings a dilemma through the gameplay. What do you do if you are deep in the level and almost at the fountain, but the monsters prove to be too difficult? Do you risk losing that elixir to save your skin and forfeit your ability to restore the fountain at the end? Or do you play it safe and stock up heavily on recovery items, taking up precious room in your inventory that could be used for other valuables like keys or wing boots? Suddenly the game becomes a little bit strategy oriented as well. So all of this gives us a well fleshed out world with a decent story to work with and more than one reason to go out and explore the world slash destroy all the evil things. The gameplay is easy to learn, difficult to master. We can walk, run, jump, attack, cast magic, and use items. Pressing the left or right directional buttons makes our hero walk, but continuing to hold down the button changes it into a run. Pairing this with the jump is how you can clear large gaps and jump over certain enemies. The attack is a simple sword thrust, but it gets more effective the better weapon you hold. You start with no magic, but can build up your arsenal first with simple straightforward blasts, then later with arcing ripples of pure destruction. The items are rather varied, some of which are more situation dependent than others. For example, the flight abilities of the wing boots are less desired in a more claustrophobia inducing level. As you travel through the world tree, you will find many establishments scattered throughout its trunk and branches. Each town or village will have various facilities to offer, some more than others. Sometimes you might really need a specific key, but only one of the towns nearby will have the key shop. Learning the lay of the land becomes important enough to keep you from backtracking needlessly. The enemies you will face are some of the most bizarre creatures to be found in a medieval fantasy game in the late 80s. The bosses are even meaner, boasting sprites that take up sizable chunks of the screen. They hit incredibly hard too, so watch that health gauge and I hope you have enough red potions for the fight. Enemies and bosses drop either money or food. I honestly thought the food dropped was a potato at first. The former funding your pending adventures, and the latter fueling your health mid-adventure. Every enemy has a best way to defeat them. Sometimes it's careful and strategic moving, jumping, and attacking, and sometimes it's just run up to them and jam your blade in their face. Learning your opponents is a good idea here. This game is by no means an easy game, and death hangs around ominously awaiting your elf character's demise. Should you bite the big one, you are not treated to some dull black screen with a simple game over on it. Instead, the game stays on the screen where you died. Something, or someone, speaks to you and reminds you to not have negative thoughts, as well as to remember your mantra, which is something important you are given by the gurus, before finding yourself inexplicably back at one of the gurus. It's almost as if it could be one or, or more or all of the gurus talking to you th through some sort of ever-present undeath communication channel or something and pulling you back to a safe spot before your adventure turned fatal. It makes one hell of an impression. One of the apex moments in this game is when you take on the dragon. Hey, this isn't a part of the Dragon Slayer series for nothing. This guy has a simple enough pattern, but his attacks hurt. I'm not even sure if you can dodge some of them, I just tanked them and healed up as needed. I did make plenty of simple mistakes against this guy because, again, easy to learn, difficult to master. Although, I did make the mistake of standing too close to the door when pressing the buttons to use my magic and items and whatnot and ended up accidentally going back through it. This seemed to reset the dragon's health while I was still minus whatever items and magic I used before directional buttoning myself through the door. I only had myself to blame for that wonderful move. Defeating the dragon nets you the crowning jewel of the game, the Dragon Slayer. If you followed the story so far, you will understand why it was here after the dragon fight and not before it. If you have the proper equipment after getting the Dragon Slayer, you can suit up to become the most awesome looking warrior thus far. Notice how the shield is replaced by a magic repelling helmet and your considerably exposed legs are now decked in as much plate armor as the rest of you. This extra graphical touch seriously adds to the feeling of accomplishment for getting all the best equipment. I just realized that I never spoke about the level progression, so I'm gonna do that now. The game starts out at the base of the world tree and goes up from there. Literally. 
you have to ascend up the trunk and work your way around the branches. I cannot say that I've ever seen any other game play out like this. Usually it's a jungle level, then an ice level, or maybe a sewer level, and then a lava area or something, and usually with no legitimate way of connecting them. This game takes something as common and often not thought about as a tree, and makes a sensible level progression out of it. Props. I don't want to spoil the ending, so I won't. However, I will say that this game is a satisfying game. Well-designed levels, a reasonable difficulty, well-orchestrated music, an appropriate integration of story makes this game a definite hit. Even the instruction manual is fully covered and explains much of the game well. There are even pieces of official artwork displayed on some of the pages. Yeah, there's our fully armored elvish hero taking on one of the dragon things. So awesome. So that's Fexanadu. So yeah, Fixanadu Tells a Good Story is a blast to play and provides quite a challenge.